Welcome to the third of our conversations about God, another look at our Heavenly Father in the larger setting of the universe-wide great controversy over His character and government. As you may recall, last time we considered again what went wrong in God's family, what went wrong in God's universe. Because if we can understand what went wrong, we're in a better position to understand what needs to be set right or put right and what it would take to set things right and keep them right for eternity. And then to the extent that we've all been involved in what went wrong, if we can understand what it is that went wrong, we would be better able to understand what we need to do, if anything, in order to be set right and enjoy the rightness of the universe once again. Now, it surely is apparent from the biblical description of this controversy in God's family that what went wrong was a breakdown of trust and trustworthiness, even to the point of war up in heaven, as Revelation describes it. And down on this planet, a continuing misunderstanding and distrust of our God. Not that we've become irreligious, all of us, but we've allowed ourselves to be deceived by the adversary. And even many who worship, worship a false picture of God with all the hazards that follow because we tend to become like the one we worship and admire. Now, surely there can be no real and lasting peace until trust and trustworthiness have been restored. And that's why the title for this evening, All God Asks is Trust. Now, that includes loyal and disloyal members of the family. Loyal angels, all God asks of them is trust. Even of us damaged sinners, all God asks is, is trust. Because where there is mutual trust and trustworthiness, there is perfect peace, perfect freedom, perfect security, all is right, all is well. But even of us, us damaged sinners who need so much help, all God asks is trust, because if we only trusted God enough to be willing to listen, to stand humbly in His presence and ask, what must I do to be saved? What must I do to be well? You know that God is the Creator could readily and eagerly heal all the damage done. There is no substitute for trust. Nothing else is as important as trust. All the generous and gracious provisions of the plan of salvation are of no avail whatever if we don't trust God enough to let Him do for us what He's so eager to do. Now, I think this helps explain Paul's very brief reply to the jailer in Philippi. You remember when the earthquake broke down the doors of that jail, and the jailer, fearing that the prisoners had escaped, in which case he would be executed himself, ran in and fell down at the feet of Paul and Silas. And you can be sure he earnestly inquired, what must I do to be saved? At least, what must I do to be safe? And Paul replied, not, well, if you have the time, I have 20 lessons for you. Could we sit here amid the rubble and I'll lead you right through the doctrines of the church? No, all Paul said was, in the familiar wording, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ 
and you will be saved. I thought one also had to have faith as well as belief. Sometimes we go to great lengths to explain the difference between belief and faith. I think of all the illustrations I've heard during my life to explain the difference. I think the one that impressed me the most was the story of the man who strung a cable over the chasm at Niagara Falls and then crossed it in a wheelbarrow and came back. And then he turned to the crowd and said, do you believe I can do that again? And the man said, yes, I believe you can. Then climb in my wheelbarrow. Not on your life, said the man. You see, said the preacher, he believed he could make it across, but he didn't have faith. I would say you could have all the faith in the world that he'd go across every hour on the hour, but you couldn't get me in that wheelbarrow. I don't like places like that, and have you looked in the chasm lately? Besides, there is no such difference between belief and faith in the Bible. There's only one word. If you'll forgive the Greek, it's pistis, P-I-S-T-I-S. And we must remember that conversation between the jailer and Paul was in Greek. And that's the reason for these different translations on the Bible reference sheet. Acts 16, 30 and 31. First from the King James, the verse we've all memorized. Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. But you'll notice in the New English Bible, put your trust in the Lord Jesus. It's the same word. This word pistis can mean belief, faith, trust, confidence. And the, ver the versions vary this just for, for variety. Then the Berkeley version has, have faith in the Lord Jesus. They're all exactly the same. I suppose we're the most familiar with the word faith. And as Christians, we talk about it a great deal. But what is this faith? What do we mean when we say to a person, have faith, or you should have more faith, or we're saved by faith, or righteousness by faith? Faith is so variously used these days that we almost need another word. A boxer will succeed in beating his opponent into a state of insensibility, and when asked by the reporters to what he attributes his surprising success, he will say, my faith. But then the most notorious definition, I'm sure you may have heard, is the one given by a small schoolboy. He said, faith is believing what you know ain't so. You see, if you're prepared to believe what you know ain't so, now that's real faith. Now, we wouldn't go that far, but might we say, uh, faith is believing something for which you have insufficient evidence. Because if you had sufficient evidence, you wouldn't say, I accept that by faith. You'd say, I know. Does that mean the more we come to know God, the less faith we'll have? And someday we'll stand in His presence and say, God, I see you now, and that's the end of my faith. I'll never trust you again because now I know you? Well, does the famous verse in Hebrews 11.1 1 help us? What verse has been more memorized than this? Hebrews 11.1 1 on the Bible reference sheet. First, the familiar wording of the King James. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Does it help to know that faith is a substance? or that faith is the evidence of things not seen. That would suggest that if you have faith in something, that's evidence that it really is so. So if you have faith as a man in the moon, that proves there must be one. Now, that doesn't make sense. But do we sometimes use faith this way? Does Hebrews 11 encourage us to do so? Look at those two words translated substance and evidence. Take evidence first. The Greek word is elenkos. It's a noun that comes from the verb that's used of the work of the Holy Spirit, that when the Spirit comes, He will convince you, He will convict you, He will settle you into the truth. A better translation would be conviction. Faith is conviction. 
Then the other word, substance. Uh, this is a word we don't often use in English. Hypostasis comes from the Greek hypostasis. That doesn't help much to know that faith is a hypostasis, does it? But does it help to know that faith is a substance? The Greek word hypostasis, not to go into it too much, means literally that which stands under, and that's where substance came from, which is very good Latin, but not very good English. Not until the turn of the century did scholars really discover what this word means. As archaeologists were digging in the sands of Egypt looking for manuscripts primarily, they even found crocodiles sometimes stuffed with manuscripts. Well, among these manuscripts, they found some that were title deeds to property, uh, business uh, agreements made, uh, covenants. And the title of these documents was this very word, hypostasis. And it dawned on some of them that what the apostle was saying here is that faith is, as it were, an agreement, a covenant. God has much to offer us, but first He presents Himself. Do we find Him worthy of our trust? Then He has many things He'd like to do with us. And if we decide we can trust Him and we'd like to do business with Him, to speak of this in business terms, then that trusting relationship is faith. So how should we translate it? Look at the next three. Now faith is the title deed of things hoped for. That's where it came from. It is the word for a title deed. And the one who translated that is Mrs. Montgomery, one of the few ladies who has translated the Bible, 1924. I'm surprised more ladies don't use that version. It's a good one. Now, faith means that we are confident of what we hope for, convinced of what we do not see. Or, now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. Can you see the idea coming through of conviction, certainty? That's the meaning of faith. Now, it helps very much to look at the context of Hebrews 11.1, 1, such as the verses right before it, and remember there were no chapter divisions in the early days. Look at Hebrews 10, 35 to 39. Don't throw away your trust now. It carries with it a rich reward. Patient endurance is what you need if after doing God's will you are to receive what He has promised. For yet a little while he that cometh shall come and shall not tarry. But my righteous one shall live by faith. And if he shrink back, my soul hath no pleasure in him. Surely we are not going to be men who cower back and are lost, but men who maintain their faith for the salvation of their souls. Now faith is our conviction, you see. It's being certain about the things which at the moment we cannot see. And you who know the background of that verse in Hebrews, you know that this goes back to Habakkuk, chapters 1 and 2, where Habakkuk says to God, why aren't you going to do something? And God says, I am, but you wouldn't believe it if I told you. Well, Habakkuk says, I do, and I'm going to wait and see. And God says, if what I have predicted seems slow, wait for it. It will come. My righteous one will live in trust. That famous verse, the just shall live by faith, is not discussing forgiveness or justification. The background for that verse is, the one who is right with me and my friend will trust me and be willing to wait. And that's the kind of trust and right relationship with God that really counts. And when we come to Romans to look at that verse a little later, that's the background for it. Now, the angels had such trust. I mean, the loyal ones. They had questions, but they said to God, we trust you enough that we're willing to wait, and they waited all the way to Calvary for some of their answers. They even heard the promise to Adam and Eve that God was going to do something, and they were willing to wait because they trusted God. It certainly helps to understand salvation by faith and righteousness by faith to understand faith 
as trust in this way. We're not saved by faith. That is, faith does not save us. God saves us. But God can only save those who trust him. Like a physician, God stands ready to heal all the damage done. But he cannot force us to be well. If we don't trust him enough to listen and to cooperate and let him heal the damage done, there's no way he can heal us. Physicians cannot heal rebellious patients who stay away because they think the doctor is a quack. Only if there's trust there, and there needs to be mutual trust, can healing really take place. But now, doesn't it seem too little that God would only ask for trust? Isn't it also necessary to know Him, and to love Him, and to obey Him, uh, not to mention the need to, be, uh, to repent, and to be reborn, and to be converted, and to be justified, and to be sanctified, and even to be perfect, and the list gets so long, no wonder it discourages many people for wanting to really have a right relationship with our God. But don't be scared by that list. Taken in the larger view of what went wrong and what needs to be set right, every one of those items I have mentioned is an integral part of a single, wonderful, reassuring, transforming experience that is made available to us all. And it was never supposed to be so complicated or to be divided into so many different parts. Take to know God. What's the difference between really knowing God and really trusting Him? Look, for example, at John 17, 3. And this is eternal life, that they know Thee, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom Thou hast sent. As we discussed last time, in the Bible, to really know someone is to love him, trust him, admire him, to be his friend. That word is even used for the intimacy between a husband and his wife. To really know God is to trust him, to love him, and admire him. I can hear God saying, if only my children really trusted me, if they only really knew me, if they only really loved me, if they were only willing to, to listen and let me help them, if only they'd turn around and come back and stay with me and choose to stay forever, I could perfectly heal all the damage done, everything would be right again, and we could keep it right forever. Now, that's the whole list if you want to put it in simple terms. I often hear God saying in the Bible, how I wish my children could be my friends once again. And they could see me as being their friend. And then all would be well. Can you name anything that would be left out if we once again really were God's loving, trusting, admiring friends? Is there anything he couldn't do if we regarded him honestly that way. Now, the Bible describes one such friend. And what an honor in the Bible to be so listed. Moses was such a friend, and he's described in Exodus 33, 11 and 17. Just a little of it. The Lord would speak to Moses face to face as a man speaks with his friend. And the Lord said to Moses, I will do the very thing that you have asked, because I am pleased with you, and I know you by name. You see how being a friend is the same as being known? Well, that's being trusted, being loved, and all those other things. Now, surely such trust and such friendship with our God is no leap in the dark, as some people describe faith. Does God ask us to gamble when we trust Him? Has God left us in the dark? Surely we've been warned that it is not safe to trust someone we do not know. And God doesn't ask us to trust Him as a stranger. 
Look at Romans 10, 17, another key text we all know so well. Where does this trust come from? So faith comes from what is heard, and what is heard comes by the preaching of Christ, or some manuscripts say, the Word of God. And it's the same in effect, isn't it? Faith comes from what is heard because they didn't have copies of the Bible or Bible reference sheets the way we do. They had to go and listen as the Scriptures were read. And as they listened, they heard the truth, they heard the evidence, and some were won to repentance and to trust, particularly when they heard the truth revealed by the Son of God Himself. David surely knew what God wanted of his children so that peace could once more be restored and everything be set right. Look at Psalm 51. Here's what God wants, to have peace once again in the family. Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward being. Therefore, teach me wisdom in my secret heart. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and put a new and right spirit within me. For thou hast no delight in sacrifice. Were I to give a burnt offering, thou wouldst not be pleased. The sacrifice acceptable to God is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, thou wilt not despise. Because that means we're willing to stand humbly in the presence of our God and ask, what must I do to be well, to be saved? And he says, you need a new heart and a right spirit. And we say, then I'd be very happy to have one. Please give me one soon. Hosea understood what God wanted, to have peace in the universe once again. And his whole book is so magnificent, I think we'll find we've quoted it many times these 20 Friday evenings. Look at Hosea 6, 6 and 7. It is true love that I have wanted, not sacrifice, the knowledge of God, rather than burnt offerings. And as you know about Hebrew parallelism, the second line simply reaffirms or enlarges the point in the first line. That shows that true love for God and knowledge for God mean the same. That's what he wants. But they, like Adam, have broken their agreement. Again and again they have played me false. They've cheated. How much security can you have in the family when some of the children are playing false. Then you remember what Jesus said to Nicodemus. It had to happen to him before he would be safe to save. In John 3, verse 3, Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born anew, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now, born anew means a new heart and a right spirit. It's exactly what David said in the 51st Psalm. Do you notice that Jesus didn't say, except you be forgiven, except you be justified, except you have your legal standing adjusted, you cannot enter the kingdom? He said, unless you be changed and become a trustworthy person, a teachable member of my family, you will not be safe to admit to the hereafter. Now, how can one tell if he's really been reborn and has genuine trust and faith and then all is well? This was a question much debated in early days and is still debated to this day, was debated during the Reformation. And uh, a leader in the early Christian church wrote a whole book to clear it up, a book that has troubled many saints, the book of James. And I've selected just a little of it for our Bible reference sheet. Look at James chapter 2. My brothers, what use is it for a man to say he has faith when he does nothing to show it? Can that faith save him? You have faith enough to believe there is one God? Excellent. The devils have faith like that, and it makes them tremble. There's no friendship between them and God. Was it not by his action in offering his son Isaac upon the altar that our father Abraham was justified? Surely you can see that faith was at work in his actions and that by these actions the integrity of his faith was fully proved. Any false faith is useless, but a genuine faith is shown in this way. Here was fulfillment of the words of Scripture. 
Abraham put his faith in God, and that faith was counted to him as righteousness. And if you take a certain view of what's gone wrong in the universe, that it's just a legal problem, you can just hear the cash registers ringing now, and now there goes faith in Abraham's account. Faith is put up there. Ah, uh, the word counted has another meaning. Or considered, reckoned as. That's what it can mean. God said, Abraham trusts me, and that's good. That's what I want. That's what it means to be right. And evidence for that is the rest of the line. Elsewhere, he's called God's friend. And then all is right, and all is well. Now, how much faith do we have to have? I mean, must we trust completely, even perfectly? I mean, is that required? I mean, couldn't we get away with a little cheating? Have your husbands ever said to your wives, a wife, um, how much could I cheat and this marriage still survive? Would that make any sense? If a friend should say to you, how much can I lie and fail to tell you the truth and this friendship still last? I mean, it makes no sense. Then for us to suggest that God leaves, needs to leave a little room for cheating in this relationship, I mean, a perfect relationship is surely asking too much. Does it make sense to even raise the question? When we cheat, and cheat we have, God remains our constant friend, but we, we may be destroying our side of the friendship. You see, when what God wants is seen as friendship, a loving, trusting relationship, then what He wants is obviously not a requirement demanded, but it is an absolutely voluntary experience. This long debate between faith, works, and obedience has troubled saints through the years, but it could be so readily resolved if we looked at the biblical word for obedience. I'll even pronounce it because it's like that other word, faith is the hypostasis. This is, obedience is uh, hypakoe. The first part, hypo, means under, and akoe means hearing. There are acoustical qualities in this room. The word means literally listening under, a humble willingness to listen. Of course, if we love and trust God, we'll be willing to listen. It wouldn't make sense for us not to listen to one we love, trust, and admire. Now, could God's expectation of our willingness to listen be 100%? Our performance may be weak. We may stumble as we leave our doctor's office. But a willingness to listen, is it too much to say? Don't cheat there. Let that be 100%. Now, if it should seem that God is too demanding in asking for such a relationship, that He expects too much of us, it surely is encouraging to read about the heroes and heroines of faith celebrated in the same chapter of the same book that tells us what faith is. Look at Hebrews 11, 31 and following. By faith the prostitute Rahab escaped the doom of the unbelievers, because she had given the spies a kindly welcome. Need I say more? Time is too short for me to tell the stories of Gideon, who needed a wet fleece and a dry one, Barak, Samson, look what he did, Jephthah, David, look what he did, and Samuel and the prophets. These also, one and all, are commemorated for their faith. Is God too demanding? He even holds those, those people with all their weaknesses and all their faults and sins, He holds them out to us as people evidently who were willing to listen, loved and trusted God, and were waiting for Him to heal the damage done. And He puts them in Hebrews 11 for our encouragement. But surely no story is more encouraging than the story of the thief on the cross. What did He do? for Jesus to say those wonderful words in Luke 23, 42 and 43 at the end of our Bible reference sheet. He said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, 
you will be with me in paradise. There was a thief hanging on the cross with the thief on the other side and Jesus in the middle. And the two robbers were cursing and swearing and mocking Jesus as were the crowds. Something happened to the thief. He listened to Jesus saying, Father, forgive them. And he listened to Jesus say, John, please look after mother when I'm gone. And maybe the thief had a mother, and that really touched him. But then that saying, Father, forgive them, because over the head of Christ it said the king of the Jews. And the thief thought to himself, if Jesus ever really has a kingdom and rules over a kingdom where the king says, I forgive you, I'm a thief, I need to be forgiven. I wouldn't be safe in any other kingdom than a kingdom where the king says, I forgive you, I forgive you. And he said, Jesus, if that's the kind of kingdom you're going to reign over, I'd like to live in it. Please, could you remember me? And I think that was a little tentative. He didn't know how Jesus was going to respond. And then there came back the words that confirmed his trust. Yes, I'd be pleased to remember you. And he died with his tithe unpaid and all kinds of things in his stomach, never made restitution to anybody, wasn't baptized, never kept a Sabbath. But he'll be in the kingdom because after he died, the next moment of consciousness in the resurrection, the thief came, will come face to face with that same person in the middle. And Jesus will say to him, you need a lot to learn. And the thief would say, if you say so, that's all right with me. I hope, if something should happen to any of us on the way home tonight, that we would die God's trusting friends. Because if we do, we will arise the next moment of consciousness face to face with God, and we will not be afraid because we know the truth. We trust Him, know Him, love Him, and all those other things. We've been set right. And if when we see Him face to face, and He should say to us, you know, there's a great deal for you to learn, we'd say we'd be pleased to listen because we trust you, we admire you, we want to be your friends. You see, faith is just a word we use to describe a relationship with God as with a person well known. And the better he is known, the better this relationship may be. Faith implies an attitude toward God of love and trust and deepest admiration. It means having enough confidence in God based upon the more than adequate evidence revealed to be willing to believe what he says, to accept what he offers, and to do what he wishes without reservation, no cheating, for the rest of eternity. Anyone who has such faith would be perfectly safe to say, this is why faith is the only requirement for heaven and for salvation. Now, the pastor will come up once again and pass on the questions and see that they're properly treated. <laughs> you know, Graham, I'm very grateful that that last statement that you made about faith, such a beautiful definition, is right here on our Bible reference That's sheet. Right. <laughs> because I didn't have time to copy it down, and here it is that uh, I can refer to and, and cherish. We have had several people ask a question that I, I'd like for you to comment on. Uh, they've written this question out and have asked me personally, why, why don't you begin the meeting with a formal prayer? 
because we started with a lot of prayer elsewhere. We, we did. prayed just before we came on. But people apparently, there are some yeah. who, who are wondering. I like the thought behind that. I mean, only a saint would raise that question in the first place. Yes. But uh, when we talked about this a great deal, just a sitting down is saying something that I believe God would want us to be comfortable as Jesus did and He would converse with us. Likewise, the fact we didn't start with formal prayer. We, we didn't want prayer just to suggest that now it's time to begin the meeting and in 60 minutes we'll do it again and then you'll know when to go home. Because unfortunately, prayer can deteriorate into that. Sometimes it's almost the signal to the choir to begin the final response. See, conversation about God can be prayerful all the way through. And we wanted the conversation to be that special. And if God were here, I'd want Him to speak first, that's for sure. And that's why we have all these texts of Scripture. We want Him to be speaking. I wish He could speak more of the time. And so conversation about God with the Scriptures in, before us can be conversation with God. And you know that familiar saying, Prayer is conversation with God as with a friend. But uh, I'd like the one to know who raised the question. We hope you'll pray because we are too, all the way through. And, and I hear you saying that uh, in, in a very real sense, the whole thing is in the atmosphere of prayer. I hope so. We're, we're listening to God's Word and our yeah. questions and our, our dialogue here is our response and the shared response, which leads me to the matter of questions. Um, yeah. We appreciate the questions that have come in some very good ones. You, you're doing a good job with that little pencil. In the hymn racks where the offering envelopes are, you'll see cards there and you'll see the little pencils. Feel free to take a card out right now if there's a question about something that has been said this evening or even in earlier meetings. And uh, write that question out. You can give it to one of the ushers as you leave. You don't have to give it to us directly or you're certainly welcome to. And uh, we hope that you will, will uh, continue your thinking and response with these good questions. Uh, By the way, on the subject of prayer, yes. we have a whole, a whole evening coming up on the subject. That's the one uh, talking to God as a friend. I'm glad you mentioned that because there are some questions that, we won't, that came in last week that we won't refer to tonight because they're going to be covered right. later in a on. meeting later on. So don't think that we're uh, overlooking the questions. We're taking them very seriously and most appreciative right. because it really makes for conversation. Now, we must move to uh, some of these questions. Uh, Graham, you, you've said a great deal about trust this evening. I'm wondering when, um, I can hear a person saying something like this, when are we going to get on to the, to the really important ideas of uh, justification and sanctification, expiation, propitiation, atonement, substitution, and so forth. <laughs> haven't, we we, haven't we spent long enough on trust? <laughs> I think we've been talking about justification, but we've given it another name. Um, we'll even use those names because they're an important part of our history. And when we talk to our friends for whom those are the words, then we should use them if we're going to communicate at all. But uh, I'd rather use the words the Bible uses. And some would say, well, aren't those the words the Bible uses? No, it's going to be interesting to arrive in the kingdom and settle all debate by going up to Paul and saying, give us the last word, Paul. What did you mean by justification? Uh, could I hear that one more time? He'll say, yeah, justification, you know, your favorite word. I never used it. Well, how about sanctification? No. Propitiation? You mean uh, you used none of those terms? Expiation? Paul never used one of them. Neither did Jesus nor anybody else in the Bible. You see, they're largely Latin words that came from a period when Latin was largely used for theology. Good many of the words, good share of the words, the heavier words, have Latin derivation. Some come from Greek. Well, look at sola scriptura. That's pure Latin. And no one studies Latin these days, uh, by and large. Why do we keep using it? Why not the Bible only? Or a word I used... Um, previously, the Christomonistic principle. That's Greek. I think, by the way, I slipped and said it was Latin one time. That's Greek. Christos, Christ, and monos only. Why not say the Christ alone principle? So I would rather use simple terms as we go through, but having discussed the whole plan of, experience, of, of salvation 
And this transforming experience, we'll sprinkle these terms through, if you like, so you can see where they fit. But Jesus described the whole truth about his Father and how he could be saved without ever using one of those words. He spoke Aramaic. And I wonder if the words become a kind of shorthand, but the danger with that is we think we understand what we're talking about when we may have loaded the word with meaning that really isn't fair to the Scripture. That's principle. the hazard. So it's, it's well to go back to the beginning. And we'll try to do that. All right, let's move along to another question that has come in here. You've, you've talked about faith meaning trust rather than just knowing something. Uh, aren't there some things that we, we could say legitimately, we, we only know by faith, such as uh, that statement in Hebrews 11, by faith we know that the world was made, and so forth. Um, but I'd want to reply, by faith in what? All right. What do you mean, just know something by faith? You have a feeling of conviction inside, perhaps? Well, but what about the Hebrews passage here? Where it says there we know by faith, what would the writer mean? Faith in something, to be sure. Don't keep me waiting. <laughs> How do we know anything about where the world came from? We have to read it in the Scripture, don't we? Faith so we God. read the record there. So by faith in the Scriptures, we believe that God created the world as recorded. But that leaves another question. Can the Bible be trusted? You see? So when we say we know these things by faith and they're things described in Scripture, we're not saying, I know this because I have a warm feeling down in my heart. That could be from indigestion. <laughs> so when you say, I know something by faith, I would want to know what the faith is in. And in this case, in Hebrews 11, it's faith in the Bible. So we, we have a whole evening on this. Can the Bible really be trusted? I mean, in the most critical company, can you say, I have found the Bible to be utterly reliable from cover to cover. I believe you can, and so we have one evening the record of the evidence. Well, but that, that ties in uh, talking about the Bible and trusting the Bible. Uh, what would you say to a person who, who said, look, I, want to, I just want to take the Bible as it reads. And when I read in the Bible that, as for example in Romans 11, verse 33, in that doxology that Paul concludes there with, uh, God's ways are inscrutable. How can anyone know the mind of God? Now, if I just accept the Bible, why, why can't I just accept that statement and say, well, you know, why have conversations about God? How can we even know God? I just believe no. the Bible. Now, depending on the person who's saying this, one might reply differently, but let's assume this is a very devout person All who right. really does accept the Scriptures. Uh, I would want to make the most of that. Um, I would want to say, well, what about these other places in the Bible? Do you accept those too? What are the or places? do you just accept this one? Or oh, like places that say God can be known in Romans 1. In fact, this individual is accepting one verse in Romans and skipping another one. If that doesn't work, then I might turn to a place that says, uh, give wine to the poor that they may forget their misery and verses like that, until maybe he's shocked into realizing you can't take here a little and there a little. Uh -huh. When you say you accept the Bible, you accept it all the way through. And probably that's what he meant when he said, I accept God's Word. If it says it, I believe it. That's all there's to it. Then I'd want to point to these other verses which say that God can be known. And if He can't be known, why all this content of Scripture? Why did Christ ever come to make His Father known? So right. this, this use of one little verse can lead down all kinds of pathways. I'm sure he wouldn't want to go. So you're saying that the basic attitude of, I want to accept the Bible as it reads, is, is a That's good attitude, good. Absolutely. provided it takes the Bible, as a that whole. is, all 66 books, right. the total message of Scripture. Uh, in, in our uh, biblical Bible reference sheet here, uh, reference was made there in the, um, the passage regarding Abraham. And uh, what Abraham, uh, speaking in James, and James' reference to that. Now, here's Abraham referred to as uh, a man of faith. Uh, couldn't you call that blind faith when Abraham set out to obey God, when God said, take your son, I want you to bring him and to offer him as a sacrifice? Well, you know, this is rather similar to the example you just, just gave. We were not there at creation to see. We do have confidence in the biblical record because it's proved in so many other ways to be trustworthy. Abraham's relationship with God, why, they were two of the best friends in all history. Abraham knew God well. He'd had long experience with God. When God had asked him to do things before, they'd always worked out well and they'd made sense. So it was no blind faith on Abraham's part. 
God asked him to do something that puzzled him a great deal. At the moment, he couldn't understand, but he said, God, if it's you saying it, and I know you so well, I know this will make sense, that there'll be some solution, so I'm, I'm on my way. This kind of faith is saying, God, I'm on my way, but may I ask you why? And so on the way, he asked why. And as he thought it through, he thought, the one who gave me this son miraculously is well able to resurrect my son, or, or maybe he'll provide a substitute. And Hebrew says he was right. So instead of that being blind faith, I would say he knew God well enough to go and know that there'd be a solution that would make sense, and so it did. But there was in that experience an element of, of uncertainty. That is to say, how, yeah. how will it work out? There was pain, mm -hmm. certainly. So oh, yeah. there, there was a... There was, there and is he a, wondered. There, yes, all right. He wondered. So faith can include that kind of yeah. thing. But because but God's so based, trustworthy, based we're willing to obey Him when He asks us to do something beyond our present understanding. But it's anchored in that him. acquaintance. Yeah, that's the thing. All right. Now, uh, in this use of James, I want to come back to that one again here. Um, you have said that faith, or your James is saying that, I guess we should say, I shouldn't blame you for this, um, that faith alone is not enough. Uh, does that mean that we also have to have works? And isn't that getting back on dangerous ground? Well, that's that same matter of understanding what the works are. Uh, the word for obedience, as I mentioned, is a willingness to listen. God does not expect perfect performance. Uh, I've just gone to my physician with an advanced case of arthritis, and, and uh, he doesn't ask me to run the four-minute mile on the way home. He even helps me down the steps into my wheelchair, maybe, and says, do a little better this week and be sure to come back and take your medication. Now, what he asks of me is a willingness to listen and cooperate. And I might die the next day, but I'm going to die his trusting patient, and I'll arise his trusting patient, and all will be well. So the, the, the performance God desires of us is the willingness to listen. He knows we're too weak to do it perfectly. And I think we've set a goal for us that, that, that is really, well, it would make our God most unsympathetic. The picture of the physician is the best model we could have. God knows our weaknesses. He wants us someday to be perfect, not just spiritually, but physically, mentally, socially, all those things. But he knows it's going to take a little time. What he wants right now up front is a sincere willingness to listen and stop cheating. Then the healing is guaranteed. I mean, God has the ability to perfectly restore every one of his children, no question. He's never lost a patient except the patients who aren't willing to listen. So to know that obedience means primarily a willingness to listen is the thing. And James gives us a picture of what happens in our lives when we are willing to listen. Oh, when we're willing to listen, we begin to behave like, like God, uh, All right. uh, more and more like Him. Trust sounds like something we have to do. It, may, it might sound that way. Um, but doesn't God do it all? Is, isn't faith, what we've talked about this evening, isn't that faith itself the gift mm -hmm. of God? It's so described in the Bible, faith is the gift of God. Um, this is so important, it's much of the subject next week, God's way of restoring trust. Well, He gives everything except one thing, I believe. He gives us life. He gives us minds to weigh the evidence. He gives us the evidence. He gives us the freedom. He gives us everything except He doesn't cast the vote. If in the great controversy in this war, God were also to manipulate us so we'd vote the way he wanted. You know who'd cry foul. Mm -hmm. So God does not win this great controversy by stuffing his own ballot box, by also putting the faith, faith within us. Then you have the question, why does he put faith in some and not others? And then there's no responsibility. You say, I don't have faith. You know why? God didn't give me any. And you know what that has led to in, in theological history. God gives us everything, but he doesn't cast the vote. That's up to us. That's where freedom is. That's where responsibility is. And I like it this way. It's a little scary, but would you want it any other way? Am I right that this ties in a bit with what you'll be talking about next week? Very much. Next week, yes. How God goes about it's very crucial. doing this. If he used any other method, I wouldn't trust him. This question has come up, Graham, um, and I noticed too that as I looked over the uh, Bible reference sheet, you used 
I think, seven, six or seven different translations. It's now, how, how do you decide uh, what translations uh, to use? Are you, are you just mm. picking out the one that says it the way that you want it? To? That's a very fair question. Um, when I'm through choosing these, I have versions all over the table and the floor because I have more than 150 different English translations you of the Bible. You check them all? <laughs> I check many of them until I find what I want. That's right, but what do I want? Uh, in all fairness, um, I do go back to the original. I've taught biblical languages for years, the Hebrew and the Greek and the Aramaic, and so I check with the original. What I want is a version that will be as neutral as possible. Like last week, God sent His Son, some versions say, as a sacrifice for sin or to atone for sin. That's very interpretive. The Greek just says He sent His Son concerning sin. So I put two versions in. He sent His Son to deal with sin. That's beautifully neutral. And now I can decide how He dealt with it. Or He sent His Son to do away with sin. So if I can't find one that is neutral, then I'll put in several to show the possible meanings. And on that evening when we discuss the Bible, we'll go into that in more detail. All right. All right. We'll go into but that. What, what if I uh, only have one? Now, you say ah, you have 150. Good. I yes. maybe have 20 or 30. I don't think my wife's going to let me buy uh, the rest <laughs> to catch up with you. Well, unless you have one of the extraordinary ones I'll, I'll bring next time, like the New Testament revised by the spirits or the New <laughs> Testament translated from numerology or metaphysics, if you've got one of the mainline versions, they're all very trustworthy. But and I can read study it as, the Bible if you read it safely. as a whole. If you make everything depend on one verse, even the comma may be, might be in the wrong place. So put many passages together. The safety always is in reading the Bible as a whole. Then almost every version is dependable. All right, now I want to move to some other questions that have uh, come up that will, will help us to draw on earlier uh, meetings as well. Um, someone of our congregation would like to know, what is the meaning of the statement, and you've used it, you, you must be born again? That's a familiar question. Yes, and um, President Carter made that a popular one. Um, well, it's a popular phrase, isn't it? Born, yes. I'm a born-again Christian. Uh, what does that Nicodemus mean? Nicodemus even asked what it meant, and Jesus said, that should be pretty clear if you've read the 51st Psalm and other places. To be changed from a rebel to someone who can be trusted to be changed from a stubborn person who's unwilling to listen to someone who loves, trusts, and admires God and, and doesn't want to miss a single word. That's like being born all over again. And that's why Jesus used such a dramatic picture. Now, that's the meaning of uh, being converted. You know, you turn around and go the other way, like a convertible changes its top on a car. So to be converted means to turn around and go the other way. Now I'm stubborn and rebellious, now I'm humbly willing to listen, love, trust, and admire. And one picture is being born again. All right. I think that Jesus was uh, chiding Nicodemus for um, being a little slow to pick up something that Some, should have spoken for he itself. Should have, he should have known I think so. and experienced. Another uh, individual has written this question, um, do you see the world as a predominantly evil place? If so, how can God's plan be vindicated if evil seems to triumph over good? And this individual says, I believe that good must triumph over evil without divine intervention before Christ can come again. Well, what do you… Uh, yeah, no, I'd regard that as a very thoughtful for question. And the most important words would be without divine intervention. Um, if God had not intervened, we would be in a helpless situation because in this conflict we have an adversary who's intervening all he can and manipulating and deceiving and beclouding the intellect. If God had not intervened, we'd be in trouble. But if that's suggesting truth will triumph without God manipulating things, yes, absolutely. My understanding is God intervenes in order that truth may be seen clearly so that truth may have a chance to win. God will not win because He has intervened with power and force and manipulation. That's the devil's method. God will win in a certain sense without intervention, but He is very much involved in order to, to protect us from the adversary and give the truth a chance to be seen. But God will win because the truth is seen to be true and will agree. Let's see if we can cover a couple more yeah. here before our time is up. Uh, if, if it's true that the plan of salvation and the death of Christ was needed to confirm the faith of the unfallen angels, would it not seem that God needed 
a place like this earth to send his son to, to die, in order to answer Satan's charges. Uh, mm, one thing pops into mind is, must, must a parent die under the wheels of a truck, pushing his little child out of the way on his tricycle to prove that he loves the child? Now, that would be very dramatic. I mean, God didn't need this emergency to show that he loves his children and is worthy of their trust. But when the emergency arose, look how he's behaved. Look at the way he's handled it. So God is seen to be uh, even more clearly trustworthy. He's no more trustworthy. He's just seen more clearly in the emergency. So once again, he's taken advantage of an emergency, which is very gracious of him. And made something positive out of it. Yes. Though his heart breaks at the exactly. emergency. Exactly. That's right. Um, here's someone who would like to know more about what you referred to last week, Martin Luther, and his, uh, his problems with uh, Hebrews and James and Jude and Revelation. Do you, could you give us some actual references? This, this yeah. person would like to know where they could go for themselves. They believe what you said yes. because they trust you, but they would like to have a reference. <laughs> that's, that's fair enough. I hope they have enough evidence. <clears throat> <clears throat> well, knowing that this question was coming up, I brought one of the volumes along. Those prefaces that I read from are to be found in a series by Yaroslav Pelikan. I knew him at the University of Chicago, entitled Luther's Works. I read from volume 35 last time where um, Luther says there's no way the Holy Spirit could have inspired the book of Revelation. And since I've quoted James this evening, you know, jo uh, uh, Luther says the book of James is totally contrary to St. Paul. But now, lest we put Luther in an unfair light, you should read the prefaces with what reverence he spoke of Scripture. He says, James is a wonderful book, and I like the way it upholds God's law. See, that should balance it off. Our only question was, was he able to see the larger great controversy view? There are even glimpses of that. If you'll take the first volume here on Genesis, he says, the Holy Fathers have fancied that there once was this war up in heaven. And he said, uh, well, that's a likely idea, and it, it fits in with the statement in Jude that angels fell and so on. And he said, you know, it's true that the angels apparently were once able to sin because some of them fell. But he said the loyal angels were confirmed so that they are no longer capable of sinning. I mean, he was working with it. And I'd want to pay respect to Luther. I believe he was catching glimpses of the larger he, view, but he never followed it through. He had a bit of a glimpse there. Yeah, he did. Well, now our time has come when we must talk a bit about next Friday night's meeting. What's coming Friday night? What's the topic? God's way of restoring trust. And I believe the methods that he has used, not claims, not show of power, but evidence, are the greatest reason for trusting him. Now, you've talked this evening about the importance of trust. So we move on in, a, in how God proceeds to lead us through that experience. All right, we'll be looking forward to next uh, Friday evening. I hope that our folks will be picking up their Bible reference sheets. Yes. And as we continue these conversations about God, what a joy and what a privilege to talk together about such a wonderful Heavenly Father. Agreed.